Okay, this is our actual second video for the week. Um, this would be our second class day if we were face to face, so here we go. I'm going to just tell you that um, what we're going to talk about here is some, I'm going to give you some words and, and stuff, some definitions, so to speak, out of the book, and hopefully you have read chapter one and the introduction in the book by now. And I'm just going to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page. We all have a little bit of note taking going on so that you don't feel like you're completely out there by yourself. And I'm going to tell you um, a few things. So the first thing I've got here, this is a hundreds board. So you can take a look at it. I felt like this might actually help some of you with the locker problem. If you could look a little more in depth, because I only gave you 16 numbers, so maybe the 100 numbers might help you. You can do a similar type of thing where you basically go through and cross out every single number that has a 2, multiple of 2, and go on and go on and go on. So we're also going to use this 100 boards later to look for prime factors, prime numbers. So if you know how to do that, that would be great. Um, until then, don't stress out about it too much. But I'm going to load this into D2L and everybody will have it at their disposal. You actually may end up using one or two of them in the course of the, uh, in the entire course of this course. And so you may want that. So I'm just letting you know it's going to be loaded up. Okay. So with that in mind, let's just get started on some of the note type things from the book. So, um, if you've read through anything, then you know that one of the points of this book is that we're going to be talking about developing algebraic thinking. And in particular, as future teachers, you're going to want to be able to develop that algebraic reasoning or thinking in your students because a lot of times in the middle grades in particular, students come to us and they have very clear, maybe, maybe they have very clear arithmetic skills, but they don't have any algebraic skills. So it's really, I tell people all the time, it's very difficult to be in the fourth through eighth grades, which most of you seem to have chosen to do. Um, and the reason I say it's difficult is because it's your job to take students from the concrete concrete thinking of addition, multiplication, div division, so on and so forth, and move them into the algebraic thinking, which, as we all know, can be a little more abstract. So that's a little difficult for the teacher's role. So you've taken this on, congratulations, and we want to give you some skills to work with those students. So the first thing we need to know is, well, what is arithmetic thinking? And if you've read through your book, maybe you can pause the video or go look or whatever. And when we say thinking, reasoning is also in there. It's considered similar stuff. So if you have gone through and seen that, you know that arithmetic thinking involves operations on things we know. So operations on known quantities. So think about that for a second. Known quantities. In other words, if they've been doing stuff in their um, kindergarten through fourth grades, right around fifth grade, things start getting a little bit more weird in sixth grade, but so far they might have been doing things like three plus five. Those are known quantities. Three plus five is eight. Or they might have even done something a little more difficult, like 30 divided by six. 30 divided by 6 is 5. So these things right here, when we were in the lower grades, yes, we had to teach them how to think arithmetically. We had to teach them those skills. But now we're going, okay, you should know those things. So they should know their multiplication tables by now. They should know all their operations by now. So hopefully they know those things, and we want to move them on into algebraic reasoning. So again, if you've read in your book, Algebraic Reasoning, um, then you know that this is, by their terminology, the ability to 
to operate on an unknown quantity. Unknown quantity. Okay, um, as if it were known. So in other words, whenever we do these lovely things, like we say, oh, we're going to multiply 7 times x. Well, what you're telling me is that even though you don't know what x represents, you think you can multiply it by 7. So that means if I come along and I say, okay, let x equals 3, then you can tell me then 7x equals 21, right? So you feel like you can do the regular known operations, 7 times 3 is 21, on things that are unknown, which is what a variable is. So we start making them think a little more abstractly. We bring the alphabet into their math world, and that is usually when things start going a little bit haywire. So we have to kind of watch out for that. So, all right, those are two basic definitions. There's other stuff out there, other definitions, but those are kind of the basic ones that we want to think about. All right, so what does that include? According to your book, it includes some very specific things. So let me um, get you some information. This can include... Da, 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 includes... Um, being able to think about functions and how they work. Okay, so does that make sense? Think about functions and how they work. Think about functions and how they work. So what we mean by that is can you think um, 3x plus 7 is my function machine. Can I think about, like I did up here, well, what if x is, seven, uh, x is 3? Can you plug that in? Can you think in a function type manner? Okay. As adults, yeah, that's, especially if you want to be a math teacher, that's pretty easy. But as a student, and this is the first time you've seen, oh my gosh, you want me to substitute what in for that x? It can be a little daunting, so you have to be aware of that. Okay, and being able to think about the impact a system structure has on calculations. So being able to think about the impact a system structure has on calculations. In my math history class, I like to bring this about in a way um, dealing with, for instance, base 10. So our base 10's system structure um, has a lot to do with the way we do stuff, right? So adding and subtracting and being able to just have, um, you know, counting on your 10 fingers and 10 toes and things like that. And all that is a base 10. If you've ever looked at the Babylonians, they had a base 60s system. And the way they did things and did their calculations is pretty much completely different than the way we do. So knowing what system you're in, knowing what their structure looks like, that can really make a difference in the math that we're doing. So being aware of that. Okay, some common tools. Common tools in algebra. And again, as adults, we kind of just take these things for granted. We know we're doing them. I'm going to scoot this on up. Hopefully everybody's finished with that last page. We know we're doing them as adults, and we just kind of take it for granted. But kids, they can be very, um, you know, overwhelmed by stuff. So the first one, I mentioned it in the other video, is the doing and undoing. And that has to do with reversibility. Hope I spelled that right. Reversibility. Okay. So, and the way we often think, think about that is um, opposite operations. So, for instance, in math, if we see something like x plus 3, 
and we want to undo that addition that is sitting right there what would we do of course we would subtract three so we would undo the addition property there by the addition operation there by subtracting because we know that addition and subtraction are opposite operations so that means that x plus three that quantity that is sitting there is reversible again this is kind of just a foundational thing we know happens all the time it's in there and uh, we just assume that people know how to do that and sometimes we have to teach that okay a lot of times it's more difficult to understand the process well enough to work it backwards um, so something that's easy so to speak for us but maybe not be for students an example um, if I said solve 4x squared minus 9 equals 0, let's just do an example, then what's the opposite operation for getting rid of that 9 there? It's a subtraction, so I would add 9, both sides of the equation. Okay, so now I have 4x squared equals 9, so now what would we do? Again, we're trying to get the x completely by itself. It is x squared being multiplied by 4 there. So to get rid of the 4, we would divide because multiplication and division are opposite operations, and that would get rid of that. And then I'd be saying, okay, well now I've got x squared equals 9 divided by 4. And now what? Oh my gosh, I've got to get rid of a square operation, a squaring operation. So how can I get rid of the squaring operation? And the answer is, of course, we know the opposite operation is square root. So I can square root both sides of my equation. So now I've got x equals, and just to be on the safe side of things, I'm going to throw in my plus or minus. And I've got that square root of 9 over 4. Well, we know... I could always split that up, right? Square root of 9 over square root of 4. So I can take both of those square roots, so this becomes 3 over 2, right? x equals plus or minus 3 over 2. So x equals 3 halves, or x equals negative 3 halves. Those are my answers, right? All right. So that's kind of, for us, an easier situation for the doing and undoing because that's pretty pretty obvious but a harder example would be hey I'm gonna tell you the solutions and I want you to tell me what is an equation with the solutions x equals 3 half and x equals negative 3 halves. Okay, so we know the answer because we just did it, right? 4x squared minus 9 equals 0. That would be our answer. But the only reason we know that is because we worked the problem one direction. If we need to go backwards, everybody can probably tell this is a much more difficult problem for us than doing that. But we can undo it, right? We just need to come up with the factors and then multiply them together and work our way backwards until we get where we want to be. All right, so very much a diff more difficult problem. Okay, number two. Building rules to represent functions. That is a basic building block of algebra. Building rules to represent functions. All right. So what does that mean? It means that we're going to recognize patterns. And don't worry, you'll have lots of time to work with this when we get into the pattern section soon. We're going to recognize patterns. Um, it means we're going to organize our data in such a way that we can um, uh, see patterns and we can write functions from them. 
So maybe that means we have a nice pretty table. Maybe that means we've got a lovely drawing. There's, there's different ways to do that. But we're gonna build something so that we can get a function out of it. That can be very difficult and I think some of us will struggle as we start to create stuff. So here we go, here's an example. Take any input number Use an input number, um, multiply it by 5, and subtract 4. Well, I basically just wrote the rule in words for you, right? So we've, we've got the rule kind of written out there. So what's one way that you can represent that pattern that I just gave you? Hopefully you said, take my number, multiply it by five, that means I'm gonna have what? Five X, and then I'm gonna subtract from this entire quantity four. So five X minus four, that would be my function, right? So now I have something that I can put in there. So there we go. There's lots of things, and if you kind of read through your book, you've got lots of stuff you can look at. Um, sometimes you might see this drawn like a star, the multiple representations and such that work here. So normally we have an algebraic formula, and that would be our kind of ultimate goal. Sometimes we want to use a pattern or whatever to get there. Sometimes, like I mentioned, you might need a table to get there. Sometimes somebody might give you a verbal description. And sometimes you might have something more concrete like the manipulatives or a picture. Okay, that gives me some kind of a representation for it. And sometimes I might have a graph, so it depends on kind of how algebraic we're getting, right? But those are kind of the biggest ways that are normally used to represent a problem algebraically. So these, whenever you see the words um, on some of your state exams that say, okay, multiple representations, that's what these are. Multiple representations. Different ways to show the algebra that we're looking at. So some kind of problem and we're talking about it algebraically. That's what we're after. All right, the third way, the third building block, so to speak, of algebraic reasoning is abstracting through computation or from computation. Okay, and this is a skill I mentioned a minute ago. We're going to spend some time developing this skill. Some people are really, really good at it, and they can just kind of see a pattern and just develop their abstract thoughts, and some people really struggle with this. Like, how do I know that something is um, linear or quadratic just by looking at a table of values? How do I know that? Don't worry. We're going to get some examples, and we're going to actually do some work with it, so you'll be okay. So what we want to do is we want to think... Think about our computations independently of a given number, a particular or a specific number. Okay, that's what we want to do. We want to ignore the fact that, oh, we're looking at the first case here or the second case or the third case, and we want to come up with something that really is very abstract and that will apply to all of the things, all of the different cases. So that's what we're looking at. That's what they mean by abstracting is, hey, I don't want just this works whenever I've got three apples or whatever. I want something that's going to work every time I have any number of apples, so it doesn't matter how many apples I have, I know my pattern, I know my function, my abstract way of representing this is going to work, my algebra. Okay, so here's an example of that. And you will probably see this happen more than once in this class, this particular example. So there's a really long story about Gauss. 
And whenever he was, if you've never been in my math history class again, you're going to get some stories from time to time, sorry. So Gauss was this genius mathematician way back when in like the 1400s. And um, he was 10 and he was in one of those one room school houses where they put all the students together in the same place um, and tell them to work on different things. Well, his teacher that day wanted uh, the students to stay out of his hair basically. And so gave him, well the whole class, the problem, hey, why don't you go add all the numbers from one to a hundred? And he thought, the teacher thought, hey, they're gonna be busy with that and I can read my book, prop my feet up and not worry about anything. And surprise, surprise, what happened? Um, within about 10 minutes, Gauss, this little 10 year old boy, works his way to the front of the classroom and says, hey, I have the answer. And he's like, no, you can't have the answer. This is going to take hours of computation. And Gauss says, no, the answer is 50-50, 5,050. And the teacher is astonished because the kid has the answer. And how in the world did he do it? Um, so clearly he didn't go sit there before calculators were invented in the 1400s. He didn't say one plus two plus three plus four plus five. And some of you have probably seen this before. Instead, he looked for a pattern and he came up with an abstract way of doing it. So he said, hey, let me add the first guy to the last guy. One plus 100. That's 101, right? And then let me continue that pattern. I'm just gonna move in one on the ends and I'm gonna add two plus 99. That's 101. Okay, let me do it again. Move in one, move in one. Three plus 98, that's 101. And lo and behold, we see that, hey, this doesn't change. I still, I can do this until I get to the center, basically. Four plus 97 is 101. And so he sees, hey, we can do this, and we'll keep on doing this. Let me... Do, 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 do. We'll keep on doing this till we get in the middle. And if you think about it, coming up from the bottom, there's a hundred numbers here. The middle would be 50 and a half, right? So I'm going to add 50 plus 51. And lo and behold, that's 101. So wait a minute. Every single time I do this, just moving more and more to the inside, I get 101. And I'm pairing up the numbers. There were a hundred numbers, so there are going to be 50 pairs, right? So now I'm thinking, hey, I've got 101 as my sum. And every time I do this, I'm going to get 101. There were 50 pairs. In the middle, I can see that there were 50 pairs that I would have added up. So lo and behold, that's just a nice, simple multiplication problem, 5,050. So sure enough, he got the right answer, and um, that's, it's really amazing. And then later he came up with an abstract rule that works with this, and there is actually a formula. We'll develop those things later. But just so you can see, this, this is one of those things we would abstract through the use of computation. So we don't have to actually add all 50 pairs, right? We just add enough that we see a pattern, and then once we have the pattern, we say, hey, I've, I've got a rule, basically. So we develop a rule because we have done this abstraction. So some questions to ask if you're trying to do something like this. Well, how does that work in reverse? Anytime you're thinking algebraically and you think you have some kind of a rule or some kind of a function or whatever, think to yourself, how would that work in reverse? How can I make this go backwards, basically? How can I work backwards? Okay, so that would be the, the doing and undoing, right? How are things changing in this situation? How are things changing in this situation? So as I work through 
my structure may be changing and if they are the structure is changing then that might affect my algebraic reasoning and the third thing that you could be thinking is hey what are my operation shortcuts to get from here to there because we know we can use some operation shortcuts sometimes right and that would be using my my arithmetic, my calculations to get me to a pattern as fast as I can. What are my operation shortcuts to get from here to there? There's some questions you can think to ask yourself when anytime you're doing some algebraic reasoning that might come in handy. All right, so that is our lecture for the week. I'm sorry. It I'm going to try to keep these videos to about 20 minutes, but that one went about five minutes long. Sorry. So I think it was the Gauss example at the end that did me in. So I'm going to load up a couple of things. These are your actual homework assignments. Here we go. One is the algebraic habits of mind discussion. There are th three questions on this. Think about the three algebraic habits of mind that we just discussed. And give some examples. So I want you to actually write this out and they want you to use students as examples. If you've been a, an aide in the classroom or a substitute teacher in the classroom or anything like that, you have some actual hands-on experience with that. You have children that are in the classroom and you can say, hey, how are they using these habits of mind? Then great, you can do that. If you don't have access to any of those types of resources, then you can just think about how you were yourself as a student. and. That, that can give you some ways to lean towards these. Um, this is something that you could type up and send in an email if you wanted to. Send me a Word document or send me an email. Um, just make sure that your subject line says Math 372, Algebraic Habits of Mind, Homework. That will be your subject line. And if you send me a document, again, make sure that your name is on that so that when I print it, it's it's still associated with your name. And then the other thing that I'm going to send you is the Bubblegum Factory. Well, I'm going to put it in D2L. And this guy is, um, the Bubblegum Factory is your homework along with the algebraic habits of mind. And it's a bit like the locker problem. You're just going to think about the machines. There are bubblegum machines and they stretch the bubblegum. So read through the problem, answer the questions. And again, if you send this to me as a document or load it up for me into my email. Make sure that you are using a scanner. All right, that is going to be it for the week. So you got plenty of stuff to work on and I look forward to a wonderful semester with you. I hope you get a lot out of the course and if you have questions, please don't hesitate to email me or contact me. Thanks.